Good morning. And welcome to worship at Willow Meadows Baptist Church. We know that most of you are still worshiping with us online, and we want to say good morning to you and thank you for joining us again for worship. And uh, we look forward to you having a great experience with us today. And we have a few guests with us today in the sanctuary, and it is a delight to see your smiling eyes. <laughs> Uh, this is this is great fun for us. Uh, my heart is so happy. Um, I, mean, I came home and wept after the ice cream social, so you can imagine what today is going to be like. But it is just so it is just so good um, for those of you who uh, have been able to join us today for in-person worship. And I'm just praying we'll keep having more and more opportunities like this in the days ahead. Uh, it is it is it's good to good to be together, isn't it? Good to see each other. And it's going to be a great day. And for those of you who are at home, um, we know just what you look like. And to be honest, right now, probably there's someone sitting in your space or your space is taped over and you can't sit there anyway. So everything's good. It is going to be a great day of worship and we're so glad you're with us. I have to remember how this works. Would you stand and join us in our call to worship found on the screen? or in your worship lyrics at home. We lift up our souls to you, holy God. We trust the Lord with our past, present, and future. Teach us, Lord, that we may know your ways. Guide our every move, holy one, that we may walk in your paths of love and mercy. Let us worship the one who leads us in what is right. Together, let us worship God. Would you join us in singing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. in the sanctuary with us. Uh, we'd like to pass the peace, but remain where you are. So you may turn to your neighbors and pass the peace that way. Those of you at home, we invite you to pass the peace uh, among those in your home. Send a text message, an email, make a phone call. May the peace of Christ be with you. Continue worshiping together, singing for your glory. Thanks, Dave. 
our offering to you. This is our offering. Everything I am is for your glory. Everything I am for you, Lord. Everything I am is for your glory. Everything I am for you. It is so good to see you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Joy comes from you, Lord. And this morning, we come into your presence filled with joy. To gather together to worship a God who is very present and whose love endures forever. And we thank you that you gather here in this place and in our homes. And that you tug at our hearts and that you speak to us very clearly, reminding us how beautiful and wonderful we are because we are created in your image. And this morning as we see one another, we are reminded of your image. A God who has work in his world that he loves so deeply. You're raising disciples, followers of Christ, who would bring your kingdom here to earth as it is in heaven. And so what a great joy to celebrate this morning. Your goodness, your faithfulness, and your love. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in us and through us. And as we continue to worship, may your love be proclaimed. May the salvation that Christ offers us be proclaimed. May you have your way. We pray in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So all my friends that are here, just stay where you are for now. Uh, and all of my friends at home, I hope you're listening. You have ever played rock, paper, scissors? Yeah? So, Craig, can you safely from a distance help me play this game? <laughs> so, we can show those who don't know how to play. Okay. Go, oh, but don't stand in front of that. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we're good. 
Actually, David, can you play? Because I, I'm holding a microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Oh, you stay. You play with. Play no, no. with David. You invite me to play, play then you don't David. invite me to play. No, no. You're playing. With Come me. back. Do a lesson on hurt feelings next week. Come back. Play with David. I can't do it. Oh. Because I'm holding a microphone. Okay. Okay. So don't. Turn your back to the camera. There you go. But then how will I know what he's doing? Uh, it's a mystery. No, it's okay. Okay, ready? This is taking far too long. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's good. Okay, on shoot? Yes. Okay. So, they're going to do rock, rock, paper, paper, scissors, shoot. So, they both did scissors, which means it's a tie. Aw. Let's try one more. Okay. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, so David had scissors and Craig had paper. 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 What does that mean? It means Craig's gonna go sit down. Craig's cut out. <laughs> <laughs> David wins. Okay. So now you know how to play. <laughs> we have scissors, we have paper, and we have rock. So the great thing about rock, paper, scissors is that you can be a winner no matter what you choose from, as long as you play multiple games. <laughs> Today I have a real rock, paper, scissors. No, I don't. I didn't read this ahead of time. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> mom brain. Um, okay, so today's story, we, we hear about a rock, right? Uh, if you wanted to cut a piece of paper, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's like I've never done this before. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Stay with me, guys. Okay, I don't have a real rock, paper, scissors with me, but you can imagine them. These items are useful in only one way. Um, if you want to write a, a letter, you can't use a rock or scissors, uh, but a piece of paper would be helpful. Uh, if you wanted to cut a piece of paper, a rock probably wouldn't be helpful, but a pair of scissors would. If you're really thirsty and needed a drink of water, a piece of paper or a pair of scissors wouldn't be much help, but a rock, might be what you need. Here's the point I'm trying to make with this story. In our Bible lesson today, that's exactly what happened. A rock helped when people were thirsty. Being thirsty is uncomfortable. It can give you a headache and make you dizzy. In fact, the human body has, has to have water every day, multiple times a day to stay alive. So Moses had led the Israelites out of slavery into the desert. The Israelites were more and more thirsty, and the situation was getting very serious. And they complained to Moses. So Moses went to his tent and fell on his knees to God. God answered, and Moses did exactly what God told him to do. After he struck the rock, water began rushing from it, enough to quench the thirst of all the people and their animals. We can learn a lot from Moses. When you and I face an impossible situation, we can go to God and ask for his help. He can do impossible things. Let's pray. Dear God, when we face impossible situations, Help us remember Moses and know that we serve a God who can get water from a rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue worshiping and sing together. You may stand. Uh, let's sing together the obedience medley. Let's stand and sing together.
may be seated. Those friends, uh, Taylor, Danielle, where'd he go? Oh, he's still over there. You guys can come to the tables, Taylor and Danielle. You can sit at a table by yourselves. We'll each have a table to ourselves, okay? Just kind of got to get used to this. You're right. It's it's different. It's been a while. Larry Butcher was teasing me yesterday about not being able to leave the pulpit. He he was surprised I was even able to speak without without walking around. But uh, you get used to it. So, and it certainly makes it easier for folks at home to see. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this time. We're grateful for each person who is here. We are grateful for each person who is watching at home. And we pray now that you will open our hearts and minds to the word you have for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. Then God called Moses to deliver his people from their horror. After a few plagues got Pharaoh's attention, uh, permission was finally granted for Moses to take his people. So they left Egypt and headed for the land that God had promised to give them, which meant a lengthy trip through the desert with a few million people in the travel group. Not exactly a group you can put in a minivan and go on a road trip with. They set out on their journey only to have Pharaoh change his mind and chase after them with his armies. When they came to the Red Sea, they came up against the ultimate roadblock, and the armies of Egypt were closing in behind them. But God miraculously parted the Red Sea so that people could cross through and then closed it back up, preventing Pharaoh's army from pursuing them anymore. The Red Sea miracle took place about a month after the exodus from Egypt. A week after they crossed through the sea as if walking on dry land, the people got fussy because they had gone into the desert and they couldn't find any food. So God provided manna from heaven every morning and quail every evening so there was food for God's people. The Red Sea miracle took place in Exodus 14. Exodus 15 is a chapter of singing and dancing and celebrating because of the great miracle. The manna and quail miracle took place in Exodus 16. And, and you would think after not one but two such amazing miracles, the people would have had total trust in God. Well, think again. Today's Old Testament text is Exodus chapter 17, which occurs just one week after the manna and quail miracle. If you have a Bible nearby, please turn to Exodus 17. There we're going to find more grumbling from the children of Israel. This time it's because there was no water. You would think by this point they would have no worries about whether or not God would provide for them. But let's see what happened in Exodus 17, starting in verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out of the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hands the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? We've been talking this fall about gratitude, and one thing we have discovered is that there are enemies of gratitude that make it challenging for us to be grateful. For the next few weeks, we're going to identify some of these enemies of gratitude in the hopes that we might remove some of these obstacles and live more gratefully. 
Today's enemy of gratitude is, as you might guess from the story of the children of Israel, the good old days. This was the enemy of God's people after the army of Egypt was shut down. What became their new threat after Pharaoh's army was taken care of was themselves. It's incredible to look back and see how quickly all the singing and dancing and celebrating ended uh, and, and how quickly it wore off after the Red Sea miracle. Within just a few verses, all the joy and confidence was gone. Their empty stomachs and lack of water fountains in the desert caused them to get nostalgic about their days in Egypt, about their days of slavery. One way you know you're losing it is when you start to idealize the past and your past involved being a slave. That's when you know your memory is playing tricks on you and giving you a load of revisionist history. If the Israelites had been honest in their reminiscing, it would have sounded something like this. Remember the good old days when we spent all day making bricks in the hot sun, building those pyramids? Remember all the times we weren't sure if we would have anything to eat? Remember when we had no rights and when Pharaoh would kill our, our male children? Man, those were the days. They forgot the real past and remembered things a bit differently when things got rough and they got a little hungry and thirsty. In chapter 16, they recall that in Egypt, they sat around pots of food all day and ate all they wanted. They might as well have thrown in something about a health plan and vacation days. None of that happened at all, but that was how they remembered it when the going got tough. There's something about being comfortable about what you know, even if what you know is pretty terrible. You see, what you know is predictable. And predictable feels safe. The children of Israel have been enslaved for 430 years. It was the only life they knew for 15 generations. In slavery, every day was terrible, but every day was the same. Change is much more trying and frightening than sameness, even if the change is for the better. The memories of predictable Egypt became so much better as current reality got so much worse. Out in the wilderness, they were in uncharted territory. There was no norm. They had to depend on God for everything. They woke up every day having to trust that God was going to provide for them and lead them somewhere. Yet, they were having this trouble trusting God even after the Red Sea miracle and the manna miracles. Brian Erickson calls this phenomena post-miraculous stress disorder. Such is the power of the good old days enemy. When the going gets tough, the good old days seize control and change history, robbing us of being grateful for or even looking for God's work in the present. Just like the Israelites, we too can suffer from a major case of the good old days when things get bad or when things don't go our way. We love to talk about the good old days, don't we? I, I have yet to meet the person who doesn't think that they grew up in the very best time ever. You always hear things like, back in my day, all the teachers were kind and wonderful. All the kids got along and played together nicely. Families ate dinner together every night and had pleasant conversations. Yeah, that's just not true. Some teachers were kind and wonderful, and some were mean and awful. Maybe kids got along and played well a time or two. But usually we fought just for an hour trying to figure out the rules of the game we wanted to play. A lot of families didn't eat together, and a lot of the families that did sat in silence with a lot of heavy sighs. I always appreciated the honesty of my grandfather, who grew up in a two-room cabin with his parents and eight siblings. When you would ask Gramps about what it was like growing up, he would say, it was rough as a cob. Not long ago, I heard someone my age talking about how great junior high was. Seriously, junior high. I got two words to say to that. Leisure suits. We like to think about the good old days. The, the good old days before cell phones, even though we're very dependent on our cell phones today. 
the good old days before social media, even though social media allows us to brag about our grandkids to so many more people. The good old days before my kids grew up and moved away, even though that began their new life and adventure. The good old days before I got old and things quit working. Well, okay, actually those were pretty good old days. You know, church, church folks are awfully good about remembering the good old days. We like to remember the good old days when everyone got dressed up in their finest to go to church, when we all used the King James Version of the Bible, which of course was the version that God used, when we all sang the, the great old hymns and some of the hymns that weren't so old and some of the hymns that weren't so great and all the Gaither songs that had been written. So many times I've heard people over the years say, I, I just want things to be like they were, whether they're talking about their own life or their business or their church or whatever. Good old days can really grab us. I think it's an act of providence that God brought us to the, this passage this week. God, God truly does have a way. I learned this week that there are a handful of people who were really hurt and sad and angry that the church council had decided that for now it's best of us it's best for us to take down the paintings of Jesus that were hanging in the in the foyer. Now, everyone take a deep breath. Some of those paintings are already back up in the foyer. I want you to know that, and, and, and what I want you to know is that I am so very sorry that some of you were hurt about this decision, and some of you were angry about this decision, and I want you to know that this decision from church council was not made as some kind of political statement or to take some kind of big stand. It, it came out of the context of a conversation about sensitivity, sensitivity to our times right now, and sensitivity to folks who might come uh, to our church. The church council felt like it was good to err on the side of sensitivity, especially for those who might visit our church during this season. It, 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 you, you know church council is not about causing problems and taking stands. and That's not church council law. And you know me, and you know I hate controversy, and you know I really hate to hurt anyone uh, with this wildly, maddeningly tender heart God gave me. When I came here, I told you I don't bring a lot to the table. The two things I bring are this. I really love Jesus. And I really love people. And the joy of my life is to bring those two together. Th that's what this decision was about when it was made. It's the same idea that Paul had about removing anything that might hinder someone from hearing the gospel. For, for Paul, it was eating meat that wasn't kosher. And that upset a lot of people. Paul wrote a lot about everything he could do, that he would do anything so that others might hear the good news of Christ. That, that, that was the motive behind the conversation and the decision. The discussion was not about the paintings being bad or offensive in any way. It was about, as a church, trying to be relatable at a sensitive time. We want to make it easy for everyone to find Jesus. The paintings are lovely. And, and, and the Jesus that's in the paintings uh, looks like me. Well, it looks like a taller, fitter me. Um, a lot of scholars think that ancient Middle Eastern Jesus probably didn't look like me, but, you know, most of us like those paintings, or, or paintings like them, because, you know, we connect with it, and we feel comfort and hope when we see it. I get that. But, you know, one of the things that strikes me is, is that Jesus in, in, in a lot of paintings doesn't look anything like Elias. It doesn't look anything like other members in our church family. So I guess the, the thinking behind the sensitive, sensitivity thing was, imagine someone coming here who's seeking God and trying to find God, and, and they, they see those paintings, and they come into worship, and they hear us say, like we say over and over and over, be like Jesus, be like Jesus. They might wonder, how can I be like Jesus? How can I possibly make that connection? I wonder if it wouldn't be better if we present the Jesus of Scripture and let God's Spirit conjure up the image of Jesus each person needs to find their own comfort and hope. We want everyone who comes in our doors to know Jesus is a home and a refuge for them no matter who they are. 
Now, I know that some of you might say, I just don't think paintings say that much. I don't think it would offend anyone, and I get that. But then also ask yourself, why are some so upset about the paintings? Apparently, a painting can make a big impact emotionally, both positively and negatively. The other thing puzzling to me about the painting response is they've only been up about five or six years. They just got put up one day. And I think back to the, the, the glory days of Willow Meadows that I hear about, days of high attendance and lots of activity and lots of baptisms, uh, days when Jim Harrington was on staff. All these things happened without those paintings or any paintings being out there. We haven't seen the paintings in, in months. We haven't even seen the sanctuary till today in a long time. But we have found some very meaningful worship and times with God. I think it comes back to what we've been learning throughout the pandemic. All we need to worship God is God. Someone told me, you really stirred up a hornet's nest on this one. I, and I just want to say again, I'm so sorry. And that was so not the intent of this decision. Not at all. But I didn't really stir up anything. I started to talk about sensitivity in church council, and the result was choosing to take down the paintings for now. Uh, some, someone got angry and started up the hornet's nest. The, 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 the paintings came down in an effort to be sensitive and reaching all with the gospel. The intent was never to draw a line in the sand and create division. But we know now that we hurt some of you deeply in this process. We've made it hard for you to worship, and we are so sorry. So so, so sorry. That was never our intent to hurt or be insensitive to things you might need for worship. Our hope is to find a variety of diverse art that expresses our faith that can join some of the paintings that we already have in the foyer. We also want to use the foyer. We were talking about this at the beginning of the year. In fact, we would have done it if we hadn't had the pandemic. We'd like to use the foyer for the kids at Shern to, to have an art show and display their own art and minister to the community in that way. For now, uh, we've got some of the paintings back up. We're working on that. We, they are there for you if you need those to continue in worship. Please, please know we are so sorry. And please know that Church Council will continue to uh, revisit this issue when they meet again in November. And now back to our sermon. It is interesting, the, the things uh, that come up when you're a family. And one of the things that comes up are the good old days, the joy of the good old days. And listen, I'm not saying all the good old days weren't good. Of course, we have many wonderful memories of things that really did happen. But if the only way we deal with the present and future is by looking at the past, we are in trouble. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. But what about 2020? What about COVID-19 and pandemic life? Surely we are not supposed to be grateful for that. I mean, we're not talking about the good old days from years and years ago. We're talking about the good old days from March. I would, I would say don't even get sucked into the good old days pre-COVID life. I think that too can keep us from being grateful right now. And being grateful right now is the point of this whole sermon series. Certainly, we are not grateful for coronavirus. It has caused so much death and sickness and disrupted lives in a way none of us could ever imagine. But some good things have come out of pandemic living. I think COVID life has helped us live a lot more intentionally. It's helped us do a better job of living in the present. It's helped us focus on what is most important. It's forced us to embrace some things like technology, for example, that maybe we were avoiding or saw as trouble. But it's been good to embrace it, hasn't it? I mean, think of how, how good it's been to go online, order your groceries, and have them delivered to your home. Did you ever imagine that could happen? That's been a, that's been a game changer for some of our senior adults. And, and, and for the last six months and, and continuing for many, we've had virtual church. You know, 25 years ago, we would joke about, you know, someday we're probably just going to do church on computer. Because, you know, that was back in the days of dial-up and all that. Someday we're just going to have church on computer. And we all proclaimed that would be the death of the church. But you know what? Virtual church saved the church 
these last six months. If you had not embraced this new way of doing church, you would have had no church the last six months. And online church has helped us reach more people, both in Bible study and in worship. And so many of you have told me how meaningful the times of worship have been and how grateful you are now for our church family and for the Lord. Some of you think more now about the church as a work of God's spirit among God's people rather than a building that you go to. And that's an important step to take spiritually. And I hope it's a step that we can all take uh, individually and corporately as we grow in our faith. But it's not a step you can take by hanging on to the good old days. The good old days become an enemy when all we see is the exaggerated good of the past and when all we want is for things to be like they were in our romanticized memories. That skewed thinking can keep us from being grateful for the blessings of God, the blessings of the work that God is doing right now. And we don't want to miss out on what God is doing right now. And we don't want to miss out on being grateful for what God is doing right now. We don't want to line up with the Israelites at the point of their griping. We want to join them in their dancing and singing and celebrating as they cross the Red Sea. The only reason they didn't keep dancing and singing all the way to the Promised Land was because of their post-miraculous stress disorder because of their good old days. Trapped in their rosy revisionist history, the Israelites were blinded to God's constant provision for them. They didn't have the courage or vision or faith to trust God. Instead, they chose the ease and comfort and cowardice of the good old days. Their longing for their perfect past kept them wandering in, their de in the desert for 40 years for a trip that should have taken closer to 40 days. Sadly, we see that same thing happening many times in our own lives, that we uh, have trouble trusting God with a changing present and an unknown future. We don't really know what to do with that, and so we panic and just romanticize about the past. That's when you got to be careful, because that's when your faith can become irrelevant. The good old days can never lead you forward because they create an impossible standard. A candy-coated melt-in-your-mouth rendering of what once was. The Israelites invented Egypt 2.0 with the beatings and cruelty removed. A challenging present and uncertain future can never match an idealized past, which can leave us perpetually ungrateful for where we are right now. The good old days can steal our joy and make us different to or even opposed to the streams of living water God has provided right here, right now. Let us be careful not to keep, let the past keep us from seeking God at work right now and from moving forward into God's preferred future. It's time to stop pretending the past was perfect and just let it be what it was, both good and bad. It's time to start being grateful for our present and walk in faith toward God's future. Let's not let the good old days become an enemy to our grateful living. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this time and for your word. And we pray now that your spirit will move in each of us, that we will have opportunity to, to pray. We will have opportunity to read your word, opportunity to spend time with you this day and this week. And that it will be a time of, of reflection. It will be a time of uh, connection with you. And that it will be a time to look around at what's happening now and ahead to the things you have in store for us, things that we can see and things that we cannot see. As we think about the good old days, which, which certainly can bring us some comfort and hope, we pray that we will not forget to be grateful for the present and excited about a future that we know belongs to you. Teach us to trust. Teach us to grow in our faith. Teach us to follow you. Teach us to trust and obey and to do so in a spirit of love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Elise is going to come to um, give announcements, give our benediction, and in a throwback to Bible school, he will dismiss you from our opening time. Isn't that what we called it? Bible school? Was it opening time? I don't remember. You know, the time everyone was together. Maybe you could even play the stand up chords when it's time. I don't know. Think about that. If you don't know what the stand-up chords are and the sit-down chords are, that's part of the good old days. And I'll tell you about those later.
thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You know, God is so good, and he continues to speak and move in our lives even after worship. And so this week, as you continue to read the scripture and pray and seek God through service, and, you, and God is doing something that you'd like to share with us, would you please call Craig or Sarah or myself? Uh, we would love to talk to you, pray with you, encourage you in your faith journey with Christ in any way that we can. We know God is doing a great work even now, and uh, we just want to be part of that as well. Um, you'll notice as you came in, offering plates, we have an offering plate here by the door and then on the table. You're welcome to drop off your offering there. We continue to take offering online, or you can mail it to us. But um, just remind you that we'll have those offering plates here every Sunday. Um, next Wednesday, or this Wednesday, is our last study on the church at Antioch. Uh, it's been a wonderful study as we've been talking about this church and how it changed the world. And um, we will meet at 7 p.m. online through Zoom meeting. The link will be sent out on Tuesday. If you don't get that link, will you please let me know? We'll make sure you get the link. And I hope to see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our study. The following Wednesday, October the 7th, we're having our ice cream fellowship. Um, social distance fellowship. It'll be at 6.30 rather than 7. It's going to be at 6.30 and it's going to be at the north side parking lot rather than on the Green Willow side. So I hope you'll make plans to be with us on October the 7th at 6.30 for our ice cream fellowship. Don't forget to pick up your uh, Christmas child uh, boxes, um, Operation Christmas Child boxes as you leave. If you are unable to pick those up here at the church, um, please let Carla Butcher know. We'll make sure you get those boxes. What an important ministry that is. And so we hope that you will join us in preparing those boxes and we'll collect those in the middle of October, uh, November. Sorry about that. Um, don't forget after our benediction, will you please remain seated and I will dismiss us. Now will you uh, please hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you May God's face shine upon you and be gracious, gracious unto you. May God give you the grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth. And too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. I'm going to let the left side here, organ side, front, if you guys would dismiss. You guys are dismissed. Here in the middle front section, you're dismissed. Thank you.